Good morning and welcome to this professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt. This is part two in our best practices in social studies professional development today. Uh, this part of the session will be focusing on assessment and curriculum planning. Um, as you heard in the first session, and as you've probably heard me say multiple, multiple times before, uh, history is more than just names and dates. And I think that, um, I think for the most part, people are on board uh, with that. The old uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off talking about, uh, what is it, the Smoot-Hartley tariff um, and waiting for those responses. And that's what the research tells us uh, over and over again in terms of of that. Um, some of my heroes, we were just talking how I might not read a David McCullough book, but I will read anything written by these individuals. Um, working across um, from, let me see if I can do this. I failed last time I tried to do this. Upper left, working across on this Chance Monte Santo, who I told the last group, she'll be joining us uh, next Tuesday um, at two o'clock to talk about read, inquire, and write, the work she's doing at the University of Michigan. Upper middle is Jeffrey Noakes from BYU. We heard about some of his stuff and his uh, book is um, uh, uh, Historical Thinking Skills and Strategy, something like that. Um, that's a really good one. Upper right is Joel Breakstone, who's kind of taken over at Shegg. Um, his doctoral work was around hats, historical assessments and thinking, and he does fantastic work. Um, they're a lot smaller pieces. We talked a little bit about DBQs, and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, but if you want a, a smaller bite of the apple with a similar impact, I would recommend um, Joel Breakstone's work with hats, historical assessments and thinking. Bottom left is Sam Weinberg. We've talked a lot about him. And again, his latest book is Why, Teach, Why Learn History when you can look it up on your phone. Um, bottom middle is Bruce Van Sledrijk from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, he's done a lot of assessment work and we're gonna be talking about some of his pieces. Um, and then bottom right is Abby Reisman, uh, who we did reference in the previous session. She did the work around middle schoolers dealing with document-based questions and the impact on their learning. Um, you, we've referenced these kind of in groups before on the three on the left. They're the co-authors of the C3 framework, uh, Kathy Swan, S.G. Grant, and John Lee. Um, Kathy Swan, if you've done any of the work around looking at uh, c3teachers.org um, and the book we were talking about before, the C3 uh, inquiry planning stuff, um, that's Kathy Swan's work from the University of Kentucky. And then on the right is John Hattie, uh, who does his work with visible thinking or visible learning um, and some of the associated pieces on that. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm introducing you to some of these names, put a face to all the people. But again, really what we've spent in social studies in the past 20 years or so, maybe even a little bit longer, is that it is not a lecture format. It's not a multiple choice asterisk. Please note me on that. Um, or fill in the blank, we're asking kids to memorize those pieces. Um, that it really is so much more uh, an engaging of what we want people to be doing. And again, that's been repeated over and over again. Um, if we were doing the full day workshop of this, you would all be broken up into five different groups. We would look at this white paper from Grant, Swan, and Lee. Um, Paul, I, no, I do, I do not have anybody in the waiting room, Paul. Um, sorry, I probably should just take that. <laughs> uh, but what they did, and so what we do is we break out all these pieces and we would have everybody um, look through it and then come back to the table as a jigsaw. I love jigsaws, they're my favorite thing to do as a teacher. And it's one of those things where sometimes you feel really good about yourself. I have heard about jigsaws, I did jigsaws, and I'm like, this is awesome, and I had students do it. And then years later, when I became familiar with John Hattie's work as like the number one thing you can do in a classroom for student learning is a jigsaw. If you're looking for that just one practical strategy, it's like, oh my gosh, I did jigsaws and I had no idea about the impact of it. Um, so we would jigsaw this and come back to the table and what we'd find uh, that there's no answer. There is no one way to properly assess, properly assess social studies. There is no silver bullet in it. Um, and Grant Swan and Lee, they were brought to the table in New York with race to the top money and said, we do DBQs as part of our reasons exam. We'd like to do this better. And basically their, their findings are inconclusive. Um, because as you go through this, there's challenges that we face. There's right the, the classroom based assessments the benefit pieces are like yes when a teacher in their class can get into the assessments of students they can do it well the problem is we can't standardize it across the board 
which makes it hard to do as like a kind of a testing piece. And the very fact that it's a classroom based piece gives us all sorts of issues and problems about uh, Shane might assess something differently than Paul. And as soon as we start to try to bring everybody together to try to standardize some of those pieces, we then lose some of the other pieces. And then we struggle with some of the validity parts. And so you go through this whole thing. And I always say in the end, you can spend a couple million dollars and the answer is inconclusive, right? And that's good and bad. I don't know if I would necessarily want a social studies world where it's like, oh, and here's what we do. And that solves all the problems. Um, and I've, I've referenced books, I talk about books all the time. And if you talk with Joel Breakstone and Hats and um, uh, Bruce Lesh with his history labs and Sam Weinberg of DB Hughes, and you talk, they will, all of them, I've heard them say, this is part of the solution. Bruce very much says you can't history lab a kid to death, right? It'll just become as boring as a lecture. You have to do these little pieces, which I love, right? That's the variety. What are we talking about? And how are we going to get there? So it's such a, such a wide variety piece. Um, but that being said, there are some things we can think about and look at. And I always like to start with this triangle because um, in my previous life working in Madison, Wisconsin, this is something that we really focused on um, just to get the same language and terminology. Because one of the things we found is that people throw the word summative assessment around a lot when it's not a summative assessment. A summative assessment is the absolute end that has no impact or bearing on a student's learning. You give the test and then it's done. These are commonly the end of the year assessments, they're state exams. Um, they're the, the AYP or at the end of the year, if you're doing your student learning objectives, your SLO at the end. A, a summative assessment is never used to do anything more with a student. What we oftentimes, where I hear this in, intermingled in, is we say, well, our Civil War unit summative exam. It's, a, it's an interim exam. Because the question is, if every single kid failed it, is there an impact? If every single kid failed the state assessment and got a zero, you don't find that out for months. Those kids are already in the next grade. They're already doing whatever, right? If every single kid failed your civil war test, would you just pretend it didn't happen? Or would you go, oh, you might not necessarily go back and reteach the civil war, though you might, but you would say, man, they just did not get sourcing at all. I need to reevaluate that piece. And so if it does drive some work, if it does identify a student gap where you will then work to change things, it's an interim piece. And then on that daily basis, we have the formative. And so I just want to be clear on that because again, a lot of times people talk about those, like that summative piece, my, my chapter summative, that's just an interim because you're still using it to collect information and data. And so as you're thinking through these type of things, you want to make sure that all of these are present. Is there an end of year true summative? If you're doing that SLO piece, and I kind of mentioned before, this year I'm gonna have my students get better at sourcing. Then at the end of the year, you need to check it. And then that would influence next year's work. Oh, okay, this year my kids did not get better at sourcing. I need to reevaluate that piece, but it's with that entire next class or students. You need to have those interim pieces of thinking about where am I doing those big chunk check-ins where I'm really checking to make sure if I'm moving towards that sourcing gap or if I'm moving towards a state test or if I'm moving towards that standards compliant, not compliance, that's meeting the standards, where am I at with that? I'm gonna give them maybe a mini DBQ. And one of the things I talk about is when I was in Madison, Wisconsin and we redid the curriculum, I love DBQs, love DBQs. Would anybody like to guess when we got done writing the curriculum, how many times a year our high schoolers did a DBQ as part of the curriculum? You can show me on the screen or in the chat box. How many DBQs, and I loved them, loved them. I, hit, I see five, I see ones, we're two. They were our semester and final exams. That, and I see zero, two, threes in there. We did a lot of hats, the historical assessments of thinking. We broke down all the skills of, um, of a DBQ, thesis writing. 
So those were kind of some of our formative pieces. Then we would check in after a unit, we would do a historical assessment of thinking a hat and say, okay, well, we've been practicing sourcing in the class as our formative piece. The end of the unit now, let's do the hat that focuses on sourcing for this. And if all the kids got it, we'll move on to the next skill. If the kids didn't get it, then we need to reevaluate our sourcing piece to build them to, so by like that semester and then by the end of the year, they should be able to successfully complete that full DBQ. But we didn't, and I always say, I was a, I was a moron. When I taught AP classes, I thought the best way to do it, we practiced it all the time, every Friday. One Friday was a DBQ, the next Friday was a, an FRQ, a free response question. Every Friday, wrong approach, guys. Wrong <laughs> approach. That's what I did, and then I stepped back, I was like, oh. So I love that, but they're, they're just really big pieces. You bring in those other pieces along the way. And so the other things I always want to say when you're looking at an assessment, and I don't know how many people have seen this cartoon before. For fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Thinking about your assessments, A, do you have summative, interim, informative? Is there a variety? Are they authentic? Do you have a rubric to score them? Are they connected to the standards? These are all components that, that should be in there. And one of the things I always like to point out, we talked in the previous part about the C3 framework or the inquiry arc. And that last part, dimension four, as taking informed action or communicating conclusions, I oftentimes think can be a little overwhelming because people hear taking informed action and they're thinking, well, then that means students like have to lead a protest march. They have to do, it's communicating conclusions as well. Writing an essay is communicating a conclusion. Giving a speech is communicating a conclusion. But we need to make sure that students are given a variety of ways to show that piece. I might not be a strong writer. I can go through the essay, but if you're gonna get me an essay every single time, I will probably score less than Darcy, regardless of my content knowledge, because Darcy's a strong writer. If everyone's a speech, I'm gonna outperform Darcy because I'm a better speaker than Darcy. And so you might wanna give choices to it along with that variety piece. And I always like to stress that authentic piece about where can you get those people involved? If you're having them do something about politics or government, get those people involved. Have your mayor, have the town council come meet with your students. Have stuff published for the community. Put things out in the library, in your town library. Put it out on a website. There's been research out there that says students who know their work will be published on a blog, like a teacher blog, write better. I mean, I hate to tell you guys, they will get very old of just writing for you, right? They don't, that doesn't impress them. Have a community piece, have people come in, look at the work. Have students know what the end result is supposed to be with the rubric. Don't make them guess. What do you want from them? Show them, let them meet that expectation. And again, I always come back to standards, right? Well, regardless of where you're at, like there's that end point we're working for. We have to make sure um, that we're clear in that. And so one of the things I like to talk about, um, one John Hattie's book, The Six Characteristics of an Assessment Capable Visible Learner, um, is this piece that I, I, I like for social studies to focus on is number five, that students are able to monitor their progress and adjust their learning. Because for me in social studies, this is such a big piece that if we're truly gonna give them voice and choice and the questions they wanna ask and how they wanna interact with uh, the curriculum, with the topic, with the, with the content, then they need to be able to monitor their progress on it as well. So I say all the times, right? I'm gonna give you that big question. Can the civil, did the civil war ever come to an end? Or can the war come to an end? Is our big unit, but I want each of you to have your own individual question. As we learn about the civil war, what are you gonna share with me at the end? Which is great. Until there's 30 of you sitting in the room who all have different topics, and I can't necessarily always be there. So that's why we build in that skill of monitors progress. That's something students need to be able to do. How am I on the task? And that's where you do those rubrics. Have them self-check their own rubric. Where am I missing? 
and then coming back into that. And the reason I also focus on that is one of the things he talks about with monitoring progress is sentence stems. Students answering a sentence stem can fill back to be like, oh boy, I didn't do a very good job on that one. Right? It doesn't have to be the test. You can give them a sentence stem and if they don't know how to answer or don't feel comfortable, that's their own monitor on their own progress. I give Lauren three sentence stem. Lauren comes back, goes, Ew. couldn't do it. That should be a clue, right? And then I love the connection in there because the SHEG, the Stanford History Education Group, they have their historical thinking chart and on the right hand side, there's your prompts. If you're focusing on sourcing, give students the question, the author probably believes blank. I think the audience is. I do or don't trust this document because, and again, students doing those checks for their own understanding. And again, going back to that big choice, I want them to have voice and choice in their classroom. Not only does it rhyme, but it works. It gives them vested interest in their learning. But then again, that being said, they need to be able to do some self checks. So one of those ways besides the sentence stem that Susan do a self check, and we're gonna move into Bruce Van Sledgewright's work is a weighted multiple choice. Because one of the first things I wanted to spell the, the myth that I kind of even said it earlier, that by default, multiple choice is not bad. We make multiple choice bad by throwing in Mickey Mouse as the answer for D and giving it, you know, who was the first president of the United States? George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, or Mickey Mouse? Because the problem with something like that is even if you give them four, right? If a kid says Mickey Mouse, we're on a whole different piece. Like, uh oh, Vince said Mickey Mouse, we're in trouble. But even if you give them three real legitimate distractors, right? Uh, who was the first Secretary of State? George Washington, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, or Thomas Jefferson? And a student gets it wrong. What did you learn? The only thing you learned is that they did not know the right answer, which is not helpful. So what Bruce Van Sledderite recommends is a weighted multiple choice, and I've had one up here on the screen for a little bit, so I hope you've taken a time, take, taken a chance to read it, and if not, take a chance, take a, uh, take a moment now. What I want you to do is I want you to tell me which one of these answers, A, B, C, or D, is your best answer worth four points. Which one of these is a partial answer worth two points? Which one of these is a kind of partial answer, one point? And which one of these has absolutely no correct information in it whatsoever and is therefore worth zero points? So I'm gonna give you just a moment to look at them. People are dropping in the chat box. So if you, want, if you want to peek, you can look in there. And the question is really which one of these, and people, good, people are putting all sorts. Let's start with this, which one of these is the four point answer. And I would say based on what I'm seeing in the chat, uh, people are agreeing with C. Okay, so that's step one, we've got the four point answer. Which one of these, I'll give you the easy one, which one of these is the zero point answer? I'm seeing mostly Bs, but Melanie, since I know you're an awesome teacher leader and I can put you on the spot on this, Melanie said A, so I'm gonna ask her why. <laughs> of course you will. Um, if I remember from reading it, I don't quite remember what that relationship was going to be with the English crown. It just doesn't seem like there was any foreshadowing there. Okay. I could be very wrong, but A just seemed right to me. Oh, and now notice there's that part in there where I said, can students justify their answer? Because again, part of me in this, I'm far more interested in Melanie's response than the fact that she said A. Because she started, and she even said, well, I, I don't really read it. Like, so if she had just read it and was referencing back to pieces, it helps me understand where she's coming from. So now here's the tough one. So we've eliminated, um, We've all said that C is worth four points, right? And B is worth zero. So you're down to A and D. Which one's worth two points? 
as a partial answer. And which one's worth one point? A partial answer, but not nearly as complete as the other one. And be ready to defend yourself. Karen, would you like to jump in to tell us? You've kind of given a little bit of an explanation in the chat. Uh, Karen Neary. Um, I think it's C, only because they did form a self-government when they wrote the, uh, the, compromise, the contract, but they didn't include women and they didn't include other types of people, only white men. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. That's what I say. Did you hear me? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought maybe I didn't speak loud enough. No, but I'm sorry. My default that I usually explain in bigger ones is I never respond to an answer because I don't want to um, give people false impressions one way or the other. And it's actually, he talks about it in... Um, the book, A More Beautiful Question in the Classroom, is that idea. Um, he reinforced that for me again, that when you respond to a student, what you've done is set the bar for what a response should look like. And so I'm sorry. I, I, I'm always, I, I hear you. <laughs> so, we, so I'm seeing a lot of people saying A is the two-pointer, and then D is the one-pointer. And we had heard Melanie earlier. Melanie said A was the, what'd you say, the zero, right? And so we're, we're starting to see some differentiation. And I'm hearing explanations and I'm hearing thoughts and going through these pieces. And what I would do, what you could do, again, is that monitor progress check. When students are putting in the 4210, they're putting stuff in. But then by justifying their answers, you're getting, intro, you're getting into what they're thinking. And it, to me, it's a lot less about that correct answer and about their thinking, but it does tell me if people are missing a certain point, right? We'd all said um, that C is the four point answer. If people were picking something other than C, that's telling, like they say, well, no, it's actually B. Okay, well, what's the difference in here? I can start to highlight, well, it had nothing to do with the natives. Why, why does my class think that? Or why does Melanie think that? Or why does Vince think it's A, right? I can break people into smaller groups. Okay, everybody, you guys, you got the correct, you're over here. Um, some of you, I need you to do a quick little refresher. I need you to do a quick read. Melanie said she didn't read the Mayflower Compact. So I need Melanie's group over here. We're gonna quick do another read of that. Um, and then a couple of you over here, you guys were talking about B. Um, I just wanna, let's take a look at this, right? We remember the Mayflower Compact was written before they got to shore on the boat, right? Do we have that? We, okay, okay, so we've cleared up it, right? I knew where you guys were at as opposed to just the wrong answer. They're harder to write, they take more time, but they're a lot more helpful in trying to understand where your students are. And I put, um, I put this example in just, and that is not what we necessarily need to do, um, but I saw Bruce present this at one of my national groups. And so it was a room full of me, state level social studies people. And to hear the discussion around arguing the two pointer and the one pointer with the researcher who'd written the question was fascinating. <laughs> And for me, if you could have any of that type of experience in your classroom with your kids, they are doing more learning and you will learn more about them than any other, probably even essay that you could write. But it's the multiple choice B. Vince, yep, so I would use this as just a formative check. I would just bring in with the kids to check where we're at. If I just got done teaching the Mayflower Compact on that day, I would do this as a quick check out the door and then regroup. Everybody handed me their forms. If everybody got the correct four point answer, we can move on. If there's a split in the class or if the majority of the class got the two point answer, 
I now know, okay guys, yesterday we talked about the Mayflower Compact. Um, I just wanna make sure we're clear on X, Y, Z. Yep, and Cindy, it's, it's that partial credit, and you wouldn't even have to put it on a scale. Like if it's 10 questions, four points a piece, it's not out of 40 necessarily. It's just that ranking system. You tell me, it's not necessarily if the student is getting four points for it, it's a way to frame out their thinking. Which one of these is a four pointer? Which one of these is a two pointer? Which one, because it's gonna show their level of progression. Although you can do it as that test as well and just move them through. Um, the, University of the University of Maryland at Baltimore County, um, their arch group has uh, more of these if you wanna take a look. Um, this is actually, we've talked about Bruce Lush's book, Why Won't You Just Tell Us the Answer? Um, and he's done a lot of this work. He's out of Maryland and he's done work in conjunction with them. So you'll see some similarities in that. Uh, Joe, uh, with something like this weighted multiple choice, um, what what students would you think that is effective for? Because when I look at that and other kind of like high school level resources, it seems like some of my like honors level kids nailed it. They're going to be engaged. They're going to be interested. They're going to really dig into it. And then a good chunk of my other students aren't going to understand the options, right? Even just based on on reading level. Mm -hmm. um, so is this useful for the different, for differentiating? You just kind of like change up the answers. Like there's so many potential answers you can put in that you can kind of uh, change it to fit the, the needs of the class. Are you saying in the classroom you would have different versions of it? No, like if I have an honors level and I have, you know, it, you have your different uh, levels of rigor uh, okay. in the classroom. Um, yeah, but you, can, you can de definitely put in whatever those pieces. And I wouldn't even shy away from um, those different levels. Because what I think I hear you say is like the kids wouldn't even be able to read it to, to even accurately to go in it. Um, so I think you do have to be considerate of that. But I think you could almost just write one that those lower kids could get. And the high school, the, the AP kids or those advanced kids should still, I don't know if it's the reading level, it's still that knowledge piece, because where I think this benefits the non-high flyers that you're kind of talking about, it gives them a, a chance to explain themselves. Because if we were to do the traditional one, right, the high flyers are gonna get the 100%, the other ones are gonna get the 60s or 70s, and then we just move on. We haven't done anything with it. But I would always circle back, you know, okay, yesterday you guys did this, you know, I did the check, I'm checking where my kids are, hand them back, and just say, um, well, the consensus, you know, the answer here is, if you want to go with that technical, the four point answer is C. Anybody who didn't put C for your four point answer, please explain to me why you're thinking. And now those kids who didn't get it are going to explain to you what their thinking is, what, what they're understanding. And that could be up to you then say, okay, well, that's worth the credit. You know, if you're, if you're signing it out at that piece, um, but anytime I can get a kid to explain to me what they're actually thinking about with the process, I think it's so much more valuable than the answer itself. Um, I mentioned uh, in previous session yesterday, Diana Hess came in and she did a session about controversy in the classroom. Um, I was planning with her the day before and I always just laugh. I said, I don't even have to read your book anymore, Diana, because I've used this slide so many times, I know it's page six. Um, that students, schools have just, not just the right, but the obligation. Um, and so if you want to know more about teaching controversial topics or difficult topics, I really highly advise you to go back. Um, we're still processing the video for Dr. Hess, but as soon as that's up, she does a fantastic job of laying out these pieces uh, because we can't avoid these difficult conversations. We have to be involved with them. Um, Kay Gishwama Ginsburg, uh, the Circle Institute at Tufts University, um, and I did actually meet her at uh, Austin at NCSS last year and I said are you gonna update your chart I use this all the time and it's 2010 data and I said now that the 2018 data is out and she said that's really expensive to buy all this stuff um, the data points so she at this point hadn't planned but she said maybe I will um, but what I love about her data is they went across and she found this one theme that regardless of um, socioeconomic status gender race all the other components the one thing that she could find that led to a higher test score for kids was how often they debated. 
students who debated more than once a month had higher test scores regardless of all the other factors, who they were, race, gender, socioeconomic status. So if Diana Hess tells us we have to talk about the controversial topics and the data says if you want higher test scores, we need to have kids debating, we need to give them a different topic. But Joe, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I'll go back to Diana's work controversy in the classroom and then her follow up the political classroom. And she talks about a structured academic controversy. And she says part of our job is to teach young people how to talk with one another, especially with people who have different, um, different views. Um, do you mean formal debate or debate with just in discussion? I'm going to guess, Shane, that Kage Rama's work was around a formal debate, I believe. Um, and so what I always warn people, right? Like, okay, so kids are going to be engaged with controversial topics and you need to have debates. Do not just throw them into the deep end and say, well, Joe says for testing purposes, uh, ready, abortion. See you in 45 minutes. No, you have to be thoughtful about your topics. I always say if you, um, the first time you're gonna do some sort of debate with kids, um, debate ice cream, chocolate versus vanilla. What's the better flavor? I mean, I know it's chocolate, right? I mean, there's really no debate there, but. <laughs> um, and, or who's the greatest Red Sox player of all time? I mean, I don't know, is, Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback of all time, I mean, right? You can, you can get into things that really aren't like social dividing points in our lives, but you should be working towards them. And in a structured academic controversy, it's structured, which is the important part, and it is able to deal with the controversy. And there are links in here to some of the other stuff that Diane has done. But I can tell you one of the things that we did, because um, Diana said one of the things a state level person can do is find a state level topic that you will never find a national piece. There are um, structured academic controversies, Stanford does them. You can go get them. But what I did in conjunction with the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine, the Historical Society and the State Museum, is we built a structured academic controversy around Malaga Island. How many people here are familiar with Malaga Island? Right? This is a main topic. They're not going to get, and for those of you shaking your heads or not raising your hand, I'll give you a little bit of background here in a second. Nobody else, no national group's going to write this. So we made one. And so what happened in Malaga Island, come on, was that there was an island of uh, people who, uh, my understanding, mixed race or different things that were considered kind of undesirables um, who would come into town. I think it's Phippsburg, right? That so they would go over, I think it's Phippsburg um, and shop. And eventually there was issues and it, it, they, were, they were not the people who were supposed to be there. And the state went in and kind of took the land, removed them from the land. And if I remember correctly, um, I think property was burned and they were put into mental institutions. And so the question isn't, did it happen? The question we built is, is Malaga Island an example of state-sponsored racism? And then we pulled those resources together where people would address those issues. So the big things to know about a structured academic controversy, and I don't want to go super deep into it because two weeks ago, Paula McAvoy from um, U, uh, North Carolina State, she's the co-author of The Political Classroom with Diana Hess, she walked through how to do a structured academic controversy. But the very quick piece is that there's systems in place. You provide the information, it's timed, students are taking turns, Okay, Darcy and Melanie, you guys go first on why the answer is yes. Cindy and Michael, you listen. Now, Cindy and Michael, tell them what you heard. Now, Cindy and Michael, you tell them why the answer is no. Darcy and Melanie, you listen. Darcy and Melanie, tell them what you heard. Right, it's, very, it's timed out as you would. And what I always say, and I, I think I said in the other one, is when you give them the evidence, any claim that they are making, they should be able to point at that evidence in those documents. This is not a free for all. This is not a, well, I didn't read it anywhere over here, but here's what I know. I heard this somewhere, I read this somewhere, I saw this on TV somewhere. You stick to those documents and you do this timed back and forth. 
And what I love about it is there's a speaking component to it. You, ha you have a timed component to be able to share your, um, to share your synthesis of the documents, but there's a listening component to it as well. It's very explicit. If Melanie and Darcy are giving their part of the presentation, Cindy and Michael have to share back what they heard because then the prompt is, you know, was that accurate? Melanie or Darcy, is that what you'd said? Did they hear you correctly, right? That's a way to check in because oftentimes our debates and discussions just get into shouting matches. I'm just waiting to talk. I'm not actually listening to you. And so that's built into it. I will show you this full, um, do you have a copy of the structured debate? Um, Paul, it's, it's linked into here. So you'd have the documents for this one are linked in here, the uh, graphic organizers linked right there. Um, then again, if you go back and find Paul McAvoy's one, she'll walk you through the whole process really well. Um, I'm actually gonna show you this one. Um, and I always say full disclosure, I do serve on the advisory board for Thinker Analytics. Um, I saw them present at one point and was blown away with some of the potential. And eventually I was sharing ideas and they asked me to join because they had a different approach, but they, they were seeing some of the things I was saying. Um, Pamela, structured academic controversy, I think can be done at basically any level. It's what are the documents you're giving them? Again, the younger kids, you know, is, is reading gonna be a, a potential issue, that type of stuff. It's a structured piece, um, you know, and then it's, uh, I, I know somewhere I've seen the debate around, um, I think it's kindergarten and first graders, uh, puppies or, or cats or dogs, better pet, right? And you're still working through the process, even though it's maybe not necessarily controversial so much. Um, but I want to show you this piece. I love thinker analytics and the idea of mind mapping as a way for students when listening to a debate or preparing for a debate that they can mind map this thing out. So I'm gonna show you this video. I hope the audio and everything comes through okay. When I start the audio, if somebody could just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it, I would appreciate it. And your marks get set. Okay, now I wanna show you how argument mapping can help us talk about really controversial political and social issues. each other like they're not really responding to what the other person is actually saying right and you're not really getting at the source of the disagreement and you've probably seen this if you've ever like been on the internet or watched a presidential debate or uh, been on social media and it's, it's very frustrating and a lot of times what's happening is that people have unstated assumptions or hidden co-premises they're not actually saying out loud but that's actually where the source of the disagreement really is but argument mapping can help us expose those hidden co-premises so we can see where people really disagree so let's do an example here now this is a pretty controversial political topic, so um, hang on to your seats. And I'm sitting here in New England, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and people are trying to convince me all the time that Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. He just won another Super Bowl, right? So my friend will usually say something to me like, yeah, Brady is the greatest QB of all time. That's his main claim, right? And he'll give me a premise for why I should believe this. It's usually something like um, Brady has won the most Super Bowls of any quarterback uh, of all time, right? Super Bowls. He actually has six of them now, which is totally insane, right? Now, I'm from Colorado, so I'm not so convinced by this argument, and I'm a fan of like Peyton Manning or John Elway. And I also remember this thing called the Flake Gate, right? So uh, I'm not so convinced by this argument. Now, the problem is that if I start talking about how Brady's actually a cheater, then I'm not actually responding to my friend's argument, right? Because um, his premise here is about who won the most Super Bowls, and this is actually just like a true premise. So how am I supposed to actually disagree with him without actually just talking past? each other. I want to actually respond to what he actually said. Well, you might be able to see that there's actually a hidden assumption that my friend has. There's a missing co-premise here that connects this first premise to the main claim. And that hidden co-premise is that winning Super Bowls is what makes you the GOAT. I'm going to pause it there because when I sat and listened to them, this is the part that struck me when it comes to discussion and debates that I think when he highlights this piece, I think this is why we struggle with discuss, quote debates is because we're actually arguing about completely different things and we don't even realize it because we're too busy trying to go something, right? And I love how he then highlights, like the idea, what's really a question here is not, is Tom Brady the GOAT? What's really at the heart of the question is, is the GOAT defined by most Super Bowls? 
That's the debate. It's not about player or people, right? I can have a favorite person or I can have a this. And so then that's what the debate structures out of. And then you'll see what, what they do moving forward. That's uh, what's gonna connect this first premise to the claim above it. Now, one thing to notice is that in mind them up, I can actually label that this is an implicit co-premise with this button right here. And it actually makes it kind of a dotted uh, line around it. So that lets me see that this is something that my friend didn't actually say, but I filled it in in order to make his argument make sense. Now, take a look and you can see that this is actually a very strong argument, meaning that if the two premises are both true, then the main claim just has to be true, right? If he's won the most Super Bowls and winning the most Super Bowls makes you the GOAT, then he just has to be the GOAT. So if I want to disagree with his claim, which I do, then I have to disagree with one of the premises because I can't accept both the premises and then end up you know, disagreeing with the claim. So obviously this is the premise that I'm gonna to wanna to disagree with because it's just a fact that he has one of the most Super Bowls. So the premise that I wanna disagree with is about what makes someone the GOAT. And this is the heart of the disagreement because we're really arguing about what makes someone the GOAT and not about who's won the most Super Bowls. So I might place an objection, right? I might say that winning is easier, have a great team, right? Or I might also say that uh, winning is easier right uh just saying it is a lot easier right so these are objections that i might make to this premise my friend could come back and support the premise you could say like well um the super bowl the crowning achievement event in football right so that would be a reason to believe that winning the most Super Bowls makes you the GOAT. I just want you to see that this is really where the heart of the disagreement really lies, but it's something that my friend didn't even say initially. So all of that is just to show you how exposing hidden co-premises can help us talk about more controversial issues. And a lot of arguments that people make have underlying assumptions that they're not actually saying out loud, but with maps, we can actually expose those and then we can take a look and ask, is the argument any good? So now's your chance to practice doing some exposing hidden co-premises. So this is part of a bigger learning module that they have, and I can tell you it's completely free online for you to go through it. But then if you start to learn about argument mapping, you could have a kid before they came in for a debate, bring you the map, bring you their map and see where those, right, they started to lay out. Well, if this is true, then this is true, right? And so if a kid came in and said, well, I've got these five points I'm gonna make, and this has four supports and this has four, and I would say, Paul, why did you start your debate with that piece? You had no supporting information, right? Because they heard something or they, they, they had a point, right? A lot of times kids get stuck on one piece and they want to do it. So you could have the debate before you even have the debate if every kid's got to bring out their argument map. You could see where every kid sits on the piece. Or if you've done like um, a piece where some, you could absolutely, Lauren, he uses a tool called MindMup, M-I-N-D-M-U-P. It's a free on where, online software, uh, software tool to do it. Um, you could also have, uh, what, who do we have earlier? Darcy and Melanie are on one team and Cindy and Michael are on the other and they're discussing whatever. I could just have the rest of the class sit there and map out the argument. Well, Melanie said this, and that's a counterclaim to this, right? They should be able to do, if Cindy and Michael and Melanie and Darcy are having some sort of cohesively structured piece, they should be able to, to put all those pieces together. And I'm looking at the time, looking at my slides and realizing I need to pick it up. Um, so I'm gonna skip this this time. This is an interactive video where it helps you build one because I said, if you do a mind map, you really understand the, the key to it, but you don't know how to do it until you've done one. Um, so when you come back, you can practice this. They show you the different arguments to go into that. And then I highlight this. Um, if you ever want to show your kids a video, and we're talking about asynchronous learning, you can build in, if you're not familiar with Edpuzzle, you can put videos into Edpuzzle and then it stops and has them ask questions. So if you said, okay, you're going to watch this video before our next class, you can actually do a check for understanding with that by building it in a puzzle. And Richard Byrne and um, Caitlin Tucker have really good explanations of that as well. Um, so reading and writing, uh, I'm gonna try not to go super deep into this because I think this is where most people have a lot of the, um, the pieces already, but I will show you some of what I think my favorite resources are. This educating with evidence 
piece is really good because they have how to create an assessment system and then they do have a bunch of multiple choice examples that were created by teachers. And so you look in the, should we scroll down, there we go. This US history, if I'm talking about the Civil War and Reconstruction, these are like the common core pieces, but if I want them to get better at citing evidence, I can give them this letter from Mrs. Child to John Brown they read, here's all the teacher piece on page one. They read this and then they answer this. And so I wanna make the, the point here is that multiple choice doesn't even have to be weighted multiple choice to be quality, right? These were not just an answer and three throwaways to help distract a kid. They're points that help you understand what the kid is reading up here. So based on the above primary source, which statement best states the author's support? So it's a multiple choice that's layered in with um, uh, point of view, purpose, and textual evidence. And then again, they do have this how to create, oh, I guess they don't have that anymore. I'll have to find that again another time. Um, so that's one place that has those multiple choice pieces built in, because sometimes you just need that quick check. And I want to make that an option. And sometimes you can build your own. It's like I said, every multiple choice isn't inherently bad. So some examples, like you could show kids a document or they could read something. And then, you know, what question might it connect to? Give them four choices for questions. Show them that letter to John Brown. Do, is the question, what was John Brown's role in the Civil War? How did, uh, how did uh, who is it, Mrs. Child feel about John Brown, right? If they can read it and know, know your piece, you can have the multiple choices be legitimate questions. You can have them look for evidence in the document. If I'm making the claim that John Brown was a hero, which pieces of evidence from the letter would be my strongest support? A, this line, B, this line, C, this line. We've read John Brown's letter. What other letter is this similar to? A, the Emancipation Proclamation. B, right, they're having to make connections. You can still do the Stanford History Education Group thinking pieces through multiple choice by giving them a primary source. You can give them multiple sources and have them pick a question. You could have them rank reliability based on the sourcing of this document, which one of these would you find most reliable, less reliable? I've given you four documents, which pairs have the same perspective? A, one and two, three and four. B, one and three, two and four. C, right? They're still having to do the critical thinking piece of engaging with the primary source. It's not the, well, I either know the answer is B or I don't. It's still a primary piece. Imagine if real life decisions were like a multiple choice exam. First question, to surprise the British troops in Trenton, should I, A, dress my troops up as a marching band and offer to play a free concert, B, hide my troops in a giant horse and present it as a victory gift to the British, C, cross the icy Delaware in a rickety rowboat, D, Stay in my tent because it's cold outside and let someone else deal with them? Seems ridiculous, right? Essentially, that's what multiple choice tests do. They penalize kids for not knowing facts that are ripped out of context. On the opposite end of the spectrum are document-based questions requiring students to analyze and write a college-level essay based on 10 documents. But what if your students haven't learned to analyze one document, let alone 10? As an educator, do you have any other options? Now you do. Beyond the Bubble was developed by the Stanford History Education Group and unlocks the vast digital archive of the Library of Congress to create a new generation of history assessments. Our easy to use assessments capture students' knowledge in action rather than their recall of disconnected facts. We call our exercises History Assessments of Thinking, or HATS. HATS asks students to engage in historical reasoning as they critically examine primary sources. Most hats take just a few minutes to complete and are easy to score. They also come with interactive scoring rubrics, samples of student work, 
and going deeper videos that extend your understanding of these assessments. Your students' short written responses to these hacks will give you access to what they are really thinking. Of course, there's always the alternative. Are you sure we weren't supposed to dress up as a marching band? No, I picked A last time. It has to be C. I'd have preferred D. I'm freezing. I think I've got some ice in my knickers. Everyone be quiet. I picked C and that's the answer. And so I've been mentioning the hats before. Like, again, I love document-based questions in a DBQ essay, but they're big, they're thick, they're heavy. There's a lot of pieces to it. And you could just do these quick check-ins that are still assessing and working towards those same skills. So we saw it first with the educating with evidence. It's a multiple choice piece. You could create some multiple choice pieces working with primary documents. You can do the hats. You can get at the, um, the big, deep Stanford history stuff without fully doing the DBQ. And so they do have the link to the 80 assessments that they have. Um, they did mention in the video that there are some of them that are deeper. So if you're on the site and you see these flagship ones, they have a lot more support in them. These are, I think there's 10 where they said like, if you're doing sourcing, start with this. Because this one, we will practice sourcing, right? It's, it's about the first Thanksgiving, but the underlying component is really the, the sourcing. And so if you identify that as a need, um, otherwise a lot of the other 80 of them, they're built around a specific content. I'm teaching the civil rights movement, so I'm gonna do this one. Uh, the flagship ones are really about those big deep skills. And so again, I've talked about DBQs a lot, um, and we talked about disciplinary literacy in the last session. So this is my one where, or I, if, I, if I kind of tie some of those pieces together, if you want to do disciplinary literacy, which we've talked about as key to students' reading and writing skills, and you want to assess in social studies, I would do DBQs or this primary source work, right? All these things we were just talking about, the hats that are going to work through, that they're going to build. If you really want to tie everything together, and I know this is tough, and I'm going to just give my little infomercial pitch about National History Day. How many people here do National History Day or are familiar with National History Day? Hands up. Okay, so I don't have to go too deep into a pitch. I feel if a student does the entire National History Day arc, um, I think you've basically done what we would want a social studies student to be able to do. Um, it's an intensive piece. There's a lot of supports for it. Um, but a lot of times people are like, yeah, but what's the one thing I had, a, this was a while back, somebody called and they wanted to know who was doing the best in the state. And, and I said, well, I don't like to single out teachers because a lot of people are doing a lot of great stuff. And I directed them to National History Day. I said, if you really want to know what social studies education could and should look like, go interview the, the John Taylor from National History Day, right? Because I, I, I really believe that if a kid does that, um, they, have, they have so many different options on the performing, the writing, the web design, um, the paper, the exhibit, the documentaries. I love judging documentaries to watch some of the films, right? But it's such a heavy research base and finding the conflicting evidence and corroborating from evidence and knowing your sources. Um, that's kind of my one big go-to if I kind of have one. And that took me a little longer than I planned, but if there's any questions on assessments before we talk about a curriculum plan, um, I can take a quick second to answer those. Okay, I'm gonna do this curriculum one uh, quickly, but that's okay because normally it's an in-depth workshop time, but I wanna give you the things that you would think about. Um, this sign used to hang in my classroom and I loved it. Um, for the first time in history, we're preparing kids for a future that we cannot clearly describe. Because I would always tell kids, um, and I'd mentioned, I don't remember which session, but the idea, I got rid of homework and did um, one question take home unit tests. And kids, you know, the A kids struggled with it. And I said, nobody when I was in high school ever said I should get into cloud computing because it wasn't a thing. And I, the, the place where I taught the longest was right across the river from the mill that had just shut down. And by the time I had left there, the mill had been torn down and they were building apartments. And I said, I can't, I can't tell you what the world's going to look like, but I can give you the ability to ask good questions, think on your feet and process information that it's not about the right answer. And it's about that thinking component. And so when I meet with a district, and again, I'll acknowledge Sanford um, kind of here as a team and working with that. It's like the question that I would ask you guys if we're sitting in that room together is what is your connecting thread? K-12. 
Because oftentimes, and I love this model, we, those closed pins are normally how we teach social studies. Well, kindergarten does this, and then first grade, and then second grade, and we do, we do our city, and we, then we do our state, and then we do, we do ancient civilization, then geography, and then we move through, and the kids, which is fantastic. But if we teach it in isolated buckets, students don't see the relevance. If a kid, uh, the example I always like to say is if a kid has the opportunity and his parents have taken them all over the country and have visited all these historical sites, they might do really well in American history just for that reason. And then the next year fail ancient civilization because they've never been to the pyramids, right? That's not a legitimate piece. It can't be that content driven piece. There needs to be some skills that students are getting better at. And so when we revised the standards this last time, we added this piece that there should be a spiraling K-12 curriculum. There should be a progression of inc increasing complexity of this learning. And it's not necessarily, well, we're gonna teach US history over and over again at a harder and harder level, but these skills and concepts that can be applied at different levels across different contents. And so some examples of C3 framework, Stanford, thinking like a historian, Kids can get better at sourcing regardless of the content. Kids can get better at sourcing doing main history, US history, ancient civilization, geography, civics. And so you have to figure out what that piece is. And I always quote, one day Alice came to a fork in the road and saw a Cheshire cat in a tree. Which road do I take, she asked. His response was a question. Where do you want to go? I don't know, Alice answered. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter. And for me, this is social, so this is education. If you don't know what the goal for your kid is when they graduate as a social studies kid, then you can teach them however you want and they will get to the nowhere that you're trying to get them to. If you wanna get them to the point of they can do the Stanford skills and knock out an, an argumentation, if that's what the point, then you need to know that's what the point is, because then you backwards plan from it. I want our kids to be, uh, Doug Buell would say, social studies is argumentation. And I'll paraphrase and boil it down, but that's it. That's all we do. We lay out an argument of why this is the most likely event. And so if that's what you want your kids to be able to do, to take evidence, to lay out an argument, okay, that's your identified result. So then what does that look like? Uh, well, it's a DBQ. Great. How do you guide them along the way? What are the learning experiences instructions they need to do in order to complete the DBQ to show that they're doing the things you want them to do? And that might not be it. Maybe you don't want it argumentation. Maybe it's sourcing. Maybe it's just that. But if you don't know what that end result is, you can't get there. So as a department, I ask people, you need to figure out what your through line is. What is this? And then you get every teacher in the district on board. Not saying you have to teach this way or that way, but saying that it has to be connected and relevant to that. Because a lot of times our curriculum is just a series of darlings. And I used this quote before I got to Maine, and now that I live in Maine, and it's written by Stephen King, it's even more relevant. But he was asked, by, he was at like a young author's convention, and somebody said, what's the number one thing a young author needs to know? And he said, kill your darlings, kill your darlings, even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart, kill your darlings. He says some of his favorite characters he'd ever written didn't make it. They either didn't survive in the book or they didn't make the book. As he was working along the line, that character didn't make sense, even though he loved the character but he had to realize what the end result was. He couldn't just fill the book with a bunch of random things that he really liked. And we oftentimes have our favorite little lessons or units or activities that we really do. And if they connect to the bigger picture, that's fantastic. That's really fantastic. But you need to be able to make that connection, that standards-based connection, whether it's your school standards or your, your curriculum piece, or they're connecting to a compelling question. You need to bring out this big piece. And I will be very clear that I'm not saying everybody needs to get on the same page and everybody needs to teach the exact same thing and we're gonna give you a day-by-day -day piece. When I was in Madison and we wrote the curriculum, we wrote it at nine weeks. 
Everybody agreed to nine week parts. A compelling question for nine weeks, non-negotiables. Every kid in unit two or quarter two will read the Gettysburg Address. Do we all agree? Great. We would then collect everything else and say, well, I use this, I use this, I use this. Then we created a menu of potential things to support that. And we would say things like, okay, this unit is about turmoil of the 60s. Uh, Barb loves the civil rights movement, hates teaching Vietnam. Barb's going to do seven weeks on the civil rights movement and two weeks on Vietnam. Paul loves Vietnam, hates the civil rights movement. He's going to do seven weeks on Vietnam and two weeks on the civil rights movement. Does that work? Absolutely, because we wrote a question that wasn't about Vietnam or the civil rights movement. How did the turmoil of the 60s and 70s upend our nation? Paul's taking this more focus, but we also made sure, right? Everybody read, I had a dream. Everybody understood, I don't remember, like the Mile High Massacre. We had checks, but we never said what it did every single day. So I'm not here advocating for writing a day-by-day -day script that everybody follows. I'm saying you need to have a bigger picture in mind where everybody knows the bigger picture that they're working towards and how the pieces fit. I'm guessing there's nobody here who feels like they have too much time on their calendar. And so that's where we find the time by really being honest about what we're doing. Is this one of our little darlings that we just do because it's a lot of fun? And if it's not progressing you, then you may have to get rid of it. That's how you'll find time. So what you need to do then is sit and look at some of those pieces. This is how I frame it. Your curriculum needs essential questions. You need your three types of assessments. You need a shared kind of resource bank. And you need to connect it to the standards. And based on what you have, I'm not saying all of this needs to be done. You might just say, you know what? We really never shared resources. Let's put together a Google folder and share resources. Or maybe we've never checked our standards. Maybe we never really did. We, we were like Joe before. We had, um, we said interims, we called them summatives. We never had an end of the year. Maybe we need to build one of those. Maybe we all teach Vietnam, but we don't have the same compelling question. I don't, I don't know what the answer would be, but these are where I ask districts to check in. Because I think these are the pieces that you'll write your curriculum around. And you need that then, tar the target then at the end. That sounded awful for a second. Because if you don't know what you're trying to get to, again, it's that backwards design. So what are you aiming for? And so what I'm, as the state person, I'll tell you what you should be aiming for are the standards. Here's a video, I'm not gonna give you the whole webinar, but it's the revision of the standards some of the key changes to the standards. And again, for time, I won't necessarily go through all of these. Um, but there's a webinar that covers all of that. There are some requirements you need to make sure you're doing. Please contact me if you have questions. I get a lot of clarifying questions. No, there is not a requirement to have an American history course. It just has to be part of students' instruction. There is requirements around American history, government citizenship. Maine Native American studies. What the Maine Native American studies must address. It's in the four strands, <laughs> civics and government, history, geography, economics. And then what I love to do is sit down with teams and look, it's a gap analysis and so when you go to look at what you're covering, you need to figure out ahead of time, do you hit every single performance expectation identified in the main learning results? Is that your goal? Do you want to target out? People say, right, we've got our anchor standards, we've got our power standards. Is that your focus? We're going to hit that three times? How are we going to connect it? We kind of talked about this again. What's our through line? Are we going to say you guys can all teach how you want every day, but we're going to make sure every quarter there's the same assessments? I'm not saying the answer is yes. I'm saying it's a discussion you need to have. Where is the consistency? And then if you sit down, I tell people to physically print out the standards and sit as a team, grade level team or course team. If you're doing that performance expectation, highlight it green. If it's kind of iffy, like maybe that's not the point, but maybe I'm hitting it, it's a yellow. And if it's completely missed, highlight it pink. And then you just line them up. 
you put them up all on the wall. What's first grade hitting, second grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade, US history, world history? Are we meeting the standards? Are there gaps? And then you have to answer those questions. If I'm a third grade teacher, seventh grade teacher, US history teacher in 10th grade, what is the purpose in that grade? What am I not hitting? And if it's eighth grade, how am I preparing them for ninth grade? If it's fourth grade, how am I preparing them for fifth grade? If it's a senior, how am I preparing them to grad? Whatever that is, there's that, that progression piece. And I will tell you, so don't feel bad. Um, I've had very, very few districts in, so how long I've been doing, I've been doing kind of curricular work like this for seven years now. Um, less than, I will just say on less than one hand, the number of districts who can answer these questions. We normally don't take the time to think about it through. We teach in isolation. That fifth grade teacher does a really good job in fifth grade, but it doesn't know how they're building off of fourth grade and doesn't know how they're prepping for sixth grade. The district I told you that had like the 18 team department, they brought me in because they did not like their freshman course. It was built like 40 years ago and the guy retired and they refused to change it. And they wanted me to tear apart the course. So we went apart, we tore it apart. And then I paused and I asked the exact same questions of their sophomore course and they didn't have answers. And then I said, well, let's talk about the sophomore course. No, 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 we're just here to talk about the freshman course. And I was like, wait a minute, if you don't have any answers, why are you teaching this? They also didn't have answers. They were ready to go after destroying the ninth grade one for very legitimate reasons. There was like no standards in the whole thing. But then they had to think through their entire process. As a kid moved through their school, what was the point of their 10th grade class? How is 10th grade getting them ready for 11th grade? 11th grade, getting, what, where is that progression piece in there? Oh, and I got ahead of myself. So that's where you think about these pieces. What's going on? What do we need to do with them? And again, I'm sorry, I forgot to click through. What, where do you want your kids at? Are you hitting all the, those expectations that you guys want? I don't have a set of expectations for you. Do you have assessments that are matching, or the lessons that support the assessments? Do you guys all feel you have access to the resources in place? Is there that threaded through line to help you? And these last handful, dozen, 15 slides or so, I mean, that's, I would come down there for a day with you guys, and then you would leave there with days of work. And Melanie's half nodding her head because I went to Melanie's school, and we did this two full days, three months apart, and I think you guys still have more work to do in it. So, I mean, it's not an easy process, but these are the questions I would have you think about, because these are the things you need to build a curriculum. Um, but, go ahead, Neil. Sorry, uh, Joe, quick question. Because um, the standards are, are awesome, and at previous schools, we put in like a lot of time, got in the groups, did everything we could to make sure the standards got in. And then the standards would change or the mandate would change. And given that the standards are kind of like you're saying, like they build on each other, pre-K through 12, are the standards going to remain the same for long enough time to carry them out? Um, I don't want to put you on a spot, Neil. I would ask, what do you think significantly changed in the latest revision of the standards? Just going through uh, the, the different wording, like I, I don't have them in front of me currently um but it just seemed that when we would get something in place the wording or the focus would change like it went from having kind of like the five columns where it built up from each one to then there were kind of like really important things that the focus on there was kind of like the less intense and more intense version of the same part of the standard um i i can pull more of them up but I was just wondering if it was going to kind of remain the same for a long enough period to want to invest uh, the effort into incorporating them or if, or if the changes are just going to be so minimal that it won't really mess up anything too much. And so Karen, thank you, Karen Doughty, 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 I can never remember which one. Um, she, cause her and I have talked about this before. The one thing to know is the law is the standards. There's four standards and they're very, vague and nebulous. Students will have an understanding. The performance expectations are there to support and districts can 
choose to do those components as they see fit. There are the pieces in it. Um, I guess I would just say as going through the process and again, not at your level. So I have no idea um, how your team may respond to that. I don't feel there was significant changes at all in the standards and they've been like that since 2007. Well, um, the, the big block standards with the, those, but like the, the indicators and the learning targets inside is more I'm talking about the big blocks of saying like you need to cover, you know, you have a history block or that, you know, those are, are fine and should stay kind of as they are. But I, I was just curious. Yeah, I, again, I don't think there was in my, the standards work that I've seen done before, what happened in the 2019 revisions in social studies, I would say was minor. Um, most of the pieces, like the reframing of the personal finance was nothing new. They were just reshuffled. The, uh, the, the developing, um, the foundational developing components um, in middle school and high school, um, a majority of those were not new. They were just kind of finagled a little bit to help kind of give a little bit more of a guidance across an arc. Um, so that's my longer way of saying, I think anytime you invest in working to that, you may have to come back. We're supposed to be starting on a five-year cycle, um, but I think standards, um, a, a curriculum should re be reviewed on a semi-regular basis as well. And then once you get that big lift in, um, and again, kind of talking about like with Melanie, I think there was a lot of big lift in there. There should always kind of be that process. And we're hoping in the future, like there isn't a big just change, right? If you're doing quality work five years down the line, it should not be a throw everything out and start over. It should be a little polish up here or a little tweak there, like the geography standard, the only um, part that we really changed was technology. Like making sure people knew in the past 12 years, like ArcGIS and uh, Google Earth, like understanding geography had moved beyond coloring a map or using like as a tier, like that type of stuff. I um, mean, that whole section, you know, really didn't change. The history, we talked about it, an, an emphasis on primary sources. Um, was the kind of the change in there. The personal finance got broken out. The main Native American stuff got broken out. But um, I'm happy to schedule a time with you to talk, you know, if you want to go more in depth about some of the work that you're doing. That, uh, it'd be, it'd be great to talk and nail it down. I, I really was just wondering about if it was going to stay the same for the be able to carry it out over that long term, or it seems like what you're saying is the changes are made, but they're not major, they're very minor. So you can adapt your curriculum to fit whatever changes uh, kind of come our way. I would think so. I'd like to say if you are doing high quality social studies work to begin with, the revisions should not really impact you. And I can't imagine revisions down the road would either. Until the state or the people determine that we want a very structured, right? It's vague and nebulous. There isn't that, that kind of pain by number piece. If that were to change, that could be different, but I don't see that changing. Thank you. Uh, yep, absolutely. Um, so I've got that last slide up there. Again, remember, and I've referenced a lot of these sessions to go back. Um, I think you guys know how to get a hold of me. I am going to drop in. Give me one second. Let me start with. Hmm. 